a lot of people watching this channel might want to have a career in computing and you work in industry so I thought kind of we could just maybe have a chat about what it's like from your point of view what you're looking for from people and what you know what what people should be thinking about when they you know want to make a career in computing thank you that's a great question I mean I hire about 10 people a year a lot of them go into what I would call adjacencies to computing so for example I've got a team that's working on sensing in the life sciences and Big data is hitting everything, right? So if you're a data scientist, which most computer scientists have some inclination towards it these days, and it is a huge premium, you will have those kinds of fields as well open to you. Just so people know, you know, the organization you work for and such. I'll try to be concise, but I'm in HP Labs and I'm in the position where I direct a large group of people around the world in everything from mechatronics and robotics to 3D printing software to what we call security printing. The security printing also ties in a lot to the Internet of Things, if you'll use that cliche, being able to interrogate a physical object, whether it's a label, packaging, 3D printed object, manufactured object, and then be able to get useful information to yourself off of that. And so the software folks that I'm looking for are involved in everything from analytics, big data, to algorithms, being able to, and to the, the sort of signal and image processing that I've alluded to with sensing. So a broad set of skills in there. We do also need people who can roll up the sleeves and make this stuff webby, right? So, because it's really nice to talk about these algorithms, but I've got to put them on a mobile phone in the end. And so I do need people who are good with, you know, everything from Xamarin to, uh, you know, the, the follows on to uh, Droid and iOS programming. Pretty much everything right now has a processor somehow involved in it. And the ability for you to code at the level below just the UI, you know, the UI-based software is going to help you. In terms of hiring, what we're looking for, obviously, are people who have a very can-do attitude, who have experience across both web technology and non-web technology, right? It's better not to pigeonhole yourself and just focus on algorithms or just focus on web. Generally speaking, because I'm in a research lab, we will tend to hire people who are better at the algorithm side and at writing those types of things. But we do have uh, webby types of things as well because any technology now is going to go live. It's going to go mobile. It's going to go on the cloud. And so what we're looking for are people who've had experience along the lines of what I saw here last year when I went through with the, uh, I think it was the third year um, competition. And with the third year competition, you saw a lot of students kind of rolling up the sleeves, bringing different technologies to bear and saying, oh yeah, we need a webby aspect to that because that's going to make it demonstrable at the fair, but it also has to do something useful. And so I think you see this real combination. People always talk about, you know, older coders like myself who grew up writing, you know, ones and zeros literally at the start to folks now who know how to exercise an API for the web. People, say, people on the website say, boy, I wish those old guys would just do something interesting. And the old guys say, I wish those young guys would just do something that meant something, right? But it's actually, there's a real good commonality between there. And I think what we're seeing is that because so much technology now is intimately tied to needing good software to be written for it. You really need both of those. And so people who have that ability to, you know, do something with Raspberry Pi or Arduino, something where you're kind of really getting your hands dirty and looking at sort of the older style programming languages, whether it's C, C++, even Java, to people who are much more webby, you know, building out websites using JSON or something else. If the, if the people have both of those things, or even Python, I, I really like Python because I think it gets people's hands dirty, but at the same time they're able to percolate up from that. So that's what we're looking for, and of course being in research, if you're good at R, if you're good at MATLAB, if you're good at some of the open source types of approaches, we're looking for that as well. Those are just a starting point though. So what we're really looking for, in, particularly in a research lab, is we're looking for character, right? So I. I get to be pulled in. I've got much more technical people in the various areas on my team, of course, than I am. But we pull people in and I try to ask them off the cuff questions to see how to handle them. So one guy, and this is surprising, I said, what's the worst thing you ever did that you didn't report, you know, to EHS, so environmental health and safety? And I didn't expect an answer, but he actually gave me one and said, yeah, we had this radiation leak and I covered it up and got all the material put away and all that. And I'm like, wow, this is kind of disturbing. But uh, the way he ha handled it and he said it wasn't a big deal and it would have shut down the lab and it was, you know, so it was tritium or something that was actually relatively easy to clean up. In the end, we ended up offering the guy a job and, and hiring him. But it was an astonishing admission. And so 
I'm looking for people like that because even though the story could have been potentially embarrassing and, and at first I was like, do I have to call the h and yeah. in, in hindsight? The guy was very honest with me and he told me what he did and why he did it and that he took responsibility for cleaning up the situation and not getting the lab closed down for a year. So you have to kind of learn off the cuff uh, questions really help. Asking people that kind of shakes them out and you find that a lot that way. If you get somebody kind of off the, the normal mark for things, they'll end up telling you something they've done that was very fascinating that won't show up on their resume because they might have been embarrassed about it. And so that's one of the things that I definitely look for in a software person. Somebody who's done something that had nothing to do with their classes and they did it because of their love for what software can do. Because we all recognize that now. We're going, we're in a real transition right now in the world. And we're going from a world where open source software has become de rigueur and people know how to go out and get software that can do certain tasks. We know which type of software we can actually use. We've watched the, you know, the evolution from Hadoop to Spark, etc. Things change over time, but it's more and more open source for the sort of pedestrian things that we need to do to exist in a cloud-based mobile world. That's about to happen to hardware. And so you look at Nottingham, University of Nottingham here, there's some fascinating work being done in additive manufacturing and new forms of manufacturing. I have teams that work on that. The majority of the people that are on my teams working in 3D printing are software people. And it's because 3D printing, if you're doing additive manufacturing and you're looking at merging mass customized with mass production parts, so all the mass production parts are the same, the customized parts merge onto that in the end, you go, well, that's, that's easy enough to do. We're just going to snap those parts together like a Lego set. It's not that easy. How do you actually produce those parts? How do you track them? How do you validate them? How do you forensically analyze them? All of that takes very strong algorithmic um, expertise. It takes somebody who can actually put together the software in a modular fashion and somebody who's smart enough to figure out, I need to go look at what a manufacturing line looks like and see what they're, they're addressing. And so for me, I see a lot of this going on where people say, yeah, 3D printing, it's going to replace manufacturing. No, it's not going to replace manufacturing. It's going to augment it. If you look at what manufacturing is now, people have the largest capital assets most companies have, if they're a manufacturing company, is what they have in the manufacturing line. They've got robotics. They've got, uh, you know, very fast production line that assume the same product is going through multiple times. It's the old assembly line mentality. And so, Everything has been streamlined, optimized, overproduced so that I can get as many parts through here as possible because I make more money if I do. That now goes away and you say, well, what do I do with, you know, let's say I've got a 30 year capital asset that I'm losing money off of if I get rid of it in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. So that's a big part of what's going on is how we can merge what we're doing with additive manufacturing with existing manufacturing lines. It's not going to happen with hand waving. It's going to happen with software. And so that's a good example. People who've actually addressed that, that's one specific area. We look at healthcare for another one, if we want to draw, draw another area. So I've got teams working on what are called surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy sensors. And what that basically is, is these tiny little nano fingers that when they collapse on an analyte, there's an enhancing effect by the materials that we use, gold tips, et cetera, and, and very small, you know, just a few hundred nanometers in length for these fingers. When an analyte or a, sim, sim, a single chemical gets trapped inside of here, I hit it with a laser light and the Raman scattering that I get off of that is enhanced up to 10 to the 12th times. So up to a million, million times enhancement of the signal that I would normally get off of that analyte because of the architecture I put around that. As we start looking at that, and you can see, imagine the future, I've got some kind of a smart rag or a smart plastic surface that I just take, rub across this table, take it out, and sense everything that was on the table, right? So that's going to make forensic analysis extremely fast. And as you can see down the road, that might include things like polymerase chain reaction or PCR, which means that I can get automatic DNA sequencing or RNA sequencing off of what I've picked up if it's protonaceous. So there's a lot of different things that I can do with that technology. All of that is software. Bioinformatics is what makes me be able to analyze the DNA and the RNA. All the normal signal processing that I would normally do for audio. You know, so you're an audio expert, you know all about that. You've got 1D signal processing that's going on. I've got imaging, which is 2D signal processing that goes on there. So I'm looking for those types of things when I bring in a, a, a candidate to, for hiring. I'm looking for somebody who's got a strength in one area and then breadth across the area. And so people talk about this. This is, I apologize again to the non-states people. This is states jargon. We look for a 
T-shaped software engineer, which means somebody who's got a lot of breadth in this direction and can go deep in one area. For research, I'm looking for a comb-shaped person. So I want somebody who's got that breadth, but they can go deep in several areas. Now they'll be, typically for my lab, they'll be a master or a PhD. So we know they go deep in one area because they had to get that dissertation approved. And they've got smart people like the professors here in Nottingham walking them through that. But I'm looking for somebody who also took it and went deep in another area. So for example, somebody may be very interested in electrical engineering and because of their thesis, they had to do one thing, let's say working on you know, the, the SAERS that I talked about, the surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy. But because they were interested in signal processing, they spent the rest of their time doing music. And so they figured out how to build you know, analog and digital circuits to do electronic music or something like that. If I see something like that, then I know this person really is interested in that. They're not just doing it because it was a convenient path to a degree or a degree that they thought they'd have a you know, livelihood in. And so we're really looking for that and I try to throw students on, you know, with that. That being said, I'm one person and the other people on my interview team are going to be looking for those specific skills to make sure that they can't sneak away with that. And so for me, I will typically cover the few areas that I'm qualified to look at. Uh, perhaps imaging, perhaps uh, statistics or analytics, but other people on my team will be taking them very deep into what's under the hood in terms of a cloud deployment they said they did, right? Or what's under the hood for some type of an intelligent system that they supposedly designed. And in most cases, you'll find out the student will admit very quickly, oh, I, I actually relied on Bob or Susie or whoever to actually do some of that work. And they think that's, they're afraid to bring that up in an interview. As far as interviews go, that's, that's when we know we've hit gold, right? Because we want people who can admit they need somebody else to get a big project done. If it's somebody who actually did the whole project by themselves, hmm, might not be that good of a project, right? But if it's something where they worked with a bunch of other smart people, and that's what I've been lucky at in life. I've worked always with a lot of people smarter than me in the project that I'm working with. You dig into the expertise they have and you're like, wow, thank you. Now I don't have to sweat the details. I need to understand what you did, but I don't have to do the details. And so we're looking for people who can admit they've actually worked with people in at least an area of their project who are better than them. And you're going to have to do that in life. We all know that. And the farther you go in this field, the smarter the people around you are, you know, unless you're unfortunate. That's if you're fortunate. And so you learn to tap into those people and make a bigger project out of that. So you look at anything that's big. You want to get into industry, you've got to be on a big project that you've worked with a lot of other intelligent people on. You can acknowledge them very well and you can understand what they did without having to be an expert in that. And so again, it's that comb-shaped person. You've got to know how to fill in those voids that you don't go deep in. If you can do that, you're going to interview quite well, at least for a research job. You mentioned about throwing in questions to catch people, not necessarily off guard, but just to, to see what makes them tick. I mean, what's the way they might mess that up? I mean, I'm assuming you want them to tell the truth of these. You know, you know you're not looking for big cover-ups and stuff. So can you tell me about that? Yeah, that's a great question. And it is hard for somebody to hide. And I think that's why people are honest when you give them the, the you know, kind of off-the-cuff question to throw them off guard. I'm looking for character. And so one of the things you can definitely do to blow an interview is show that you don't have character. And so if I ask a question like that and I say, what's the worst thing that ever happened? And it becomes kind of a humble brag where the person's like, oh, the worst thing I ever did was I didn't catch that my colleague was cheating fast enough. That's not a good answer, right? So, so I'm not looking for those kind of humble brags. The, as I, the one I mentioned before where a colleague had an incident and he cleaned it up and took responsibility for its cleanup was shocking at first, but then I realized he had character because he knew how to follow through on that. And so if somebody says, oh, well, the worst thing that ever happened to me was something my colleague did or something this person did or the project failed because the people I was working with didn't follow through on it, may well be true. That's probably not something you want to bring up in an interview. In an interview, you really want to focus on the way you handled adversity and brought that to a decent conclusion. And we all run into adversity. And, and by the way, when somebody interviews and they tell me they worked with a jerk, they're usually telling the truth. That's a tough one. And so if you see that they really were working with a jerk, you try to see if they can find a way to steer that into a positive. Because we have to do that. We all work with jerks in life. We might even be jerks occasionally. And on, you know, we don't mean to be, but we are. And so the way in which somebody's going to work with us when we are, are having that, a bad day like that, or the way in which we work with somebody when they're clearly having an off day or lifetime, is, is really important. And so what we want to do is see that that person can actually handle that and move forward positively. So if I don't see that, in response to a question like that, that's one way of blowing it. 
Another way of blowing an interview would be for somebody to just be focusing on what I would call the quantitative aspects of what they've done. They're really focused on the number of things they've done, number of publications, number of you know, grants that they've got, number of awards they've won, those types of things. Those are important. But if the person doesn't then go a level deeper and tell me what it was that they did to get those awards or what they felt the award was about or who else should have shared in that award, that's another way to kind of blow an interview because you're going to be working with a team, you're going to be working with a bunch of people. If we've done our jobs right, hiring, uh, they're going to be just as smart as you or on average, right, in the, in the mean. And so it's a weird thing, but if you're actually in an interview and you're spending too much time talking about yourself and not the people around you, you're actually insulting the person interviewing you. You're not insulting the people you work with. And this is a tricky one to, to, de to describe, but I think if you stick with me here, you'll get it. If you're acting like the interviewer, like you're the best thing that's ever happened to their company, you may well be, right? You might be the best in that area, but you're also insulting them because you're in implying the people they've already got working there, or even the interviewer themselves, because uh, again, you'll have technical interviewers, are not as good as you. So it's a, it's a tricky one to balance. You do want to come across positive. You want to show that you have that talent, but you don't want to insult the person interviewing you or insult, worse yet, the team that you haven't met. And so I think that's a tricky one there. You have to, it's a delicate balance between humility, proper humility, and also being very self-confident. And so I'm looking for somebody who can be self-confident, but not have to do it at the expense of others. And so one of the ways of doing that in an interview is obviously looking for ways to positively contribute. So if somebody tells me they've got a talent for this, they're like, well, the reason why I did that was my grandma needed something that would help her stand up. And I realized that uh, grandma did not have really good leg muscles anymore. And so what I had to do was going to be something that actually augmented her. So something she could physically move around where somebody else said, my grandma still has strong muscles, but she has problem with her motor, you know, her motor neurons. And so if I was able to stimulate those, I could do that. So it's an example from, you know, bionics or bio, you know, you know some type of bio assist. That would be a good example of it. Somebody who said, oh, yeah, and, and, and by, by the way, I got an award for that, but that wasn't the reason I went into it, right? And so those are the types of things. So if you've got applications for what you've done, that's a far better way to talk about it than in terms of the recognition you got from society, whether you won a scholarship or you won an award. Yes, we look at those, and yes, those matter, but they don't matter as much in an interview. We're looking at that. That's what got you to the interview. And so that's an important point to make. When we do interviews, they will depend on the location. If we do an interview, for example, in the Bay Area, in San Francisco Bay Area, in the States, we'll have a thousand candidates for a position. And so if we're interviewing you, you're already one in 100 or one in 200 or one in 400, whatever it ends up being because of the number we hire in. We're pretty confident you've got a good resume, right? And so the interview really goes beyond that resume or you wouldn't be there. Even in Colorado, which is the state I live in, if we put out a position that has any interest to the software community, we'll have 100 to 200 applicants. And these are top people. I mean, we get applicants who are like, oh, I finished first in China this year on this particular software challenge. You're like, China, That's, <laughs> there's a few people in that country. I think a lot of people come into an interview and one of the reasons they fail some of what I was talking about before, the humble brag, the giving proper attribution, the aligning what they were doing with an application, is they forgot that we've already looked at hundreds of resumes and we already like you, right? So we're looking for something in the interview that wasn't in the resume. So it's not just, here's my resume, job done, you meet me and then, you know, where do I sign? You, you basically say, right, resume is kind of like the headlines. Exactly. So now let's find out what this guy or this girl is like, yeah? That's a great point. And the thing to keep in mind is now you're competing against the best of the best of the best, right? So we've gone through those thousand resumes. Those thousand resumes presumably were qualified people from a much larger pool. And now we're interviewing three or four of you for the final job. If somebody's not local to you, how do you approach that if you have applicants internationally? Or do you, is it that they need to get to you? Or how, how does that work? I'm just out of interest, because we've also got a global audience here, so. Absolutely, well we do try to do a three-stage screening. And so we'll go through all the resumes and of course we want people from all over the world. There's, you know, there's brilliance everywhere. We'll do a phone screen to find out, you know, who the best of the best are and that will prevent them from having to travel or anything else. Some people are allowed to uh, be distributed remotely. So I have a person in Vienna, I have a person in Boston, in Seattle, uh, and, an, and a person in Chennai, India. 
you know, and so these, these are really good folks. We've decided they can be there because they can successfully work from, uh, you know, from a remote spot. Most people will come into the Bay Area or Bristol, Bristol, UK here, or Fort Collins, Colorado, and work. And so what we'll typically do is if they've got past then the phone screening, they got on to stage three, which is the last stage before hire, we will pay for them to fly out to where we're going to do the interview. Typically the Bay Area, because that's where the bulk of our uh, research effort is, but it'll also be Bristol, UK, or Fort Collins, depending on where we're going to bring them into hire. And so we will hire internationally, but tend to ask them to relocate to one of our global offices. And so it's really up to the person. Do they want to make that move from, let's say, Malaysia to a, let's say, a China office in Shanghai? Do they want to make the move from, we got some brilliant person who's, let's say, from Egypt. We don't have a research operation there. Are they willing to move from Egypt to, say, Bristol, UK? So that's up to the person. But we do, we do definitely encourage people from all over the world to come in because it's, it's good for us. I mean, a big part of what I've worked on the last three or four years in a quantitative standpoint for uh, data analytics is looking at the impact of diversity on creativity, and it's huge. So we know that. I mean, we know that the more diverse uh, type of employee that we bring in, the better overall uh, products we're going to get. Mobile phone is much more powerful than... For example, the Cray computers, which were the state of the art when I did my master's thesis because I was working on impedance uh, tomography back then and I was killing the Cray computer. I had to actually chase students out with bad music at three in the morning so I could have the Cray to myself. Nowadays you do that, I, I've got more power on, on my iPhone than I ever had with the Cray computer.